Hello, everyone. If you're just joining us, welcome to Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Innovative Urban Governance, Charter Cities and Beyond. I'd like to welcome Paul to the stage to introduce our next panel. Thanks very much, Presley. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our panel on Charter Cities. My name is Paul Healy. I'm a policy advisor at the Radical Exchange Foundation, and I'm really excited to be moderating this panel. I'm going to start by introducing our three fantastic panelists. Uh, we'll jump into a discussion from there about many of the features of charter cities. Uh, then we'll move on to discussing uh, incorporating radical exchange concepts into charter cities. And then we'll save plenty of time at the end for a uh, question and answer from the audience. So if you're if you're watching and listening, uh, definitely don't hesitate to submit questions uh, through Brella during the during the presentation. And we'll get to those uh, with the last 10 or so minutes. So today we are joined by uh, Mark Lutter. So Dr. Mark Lutter is founder and executive director of the Charter Cities Institute, as well as host of the Charter Cities podcast. He's on the board of directors of Explorer Academy and Blackstone Charter Cities. He has a PhD in economics from George Mason University, where his research focused on charter cities. Prior to launching the Institute, he was lead economist at, for New Way Capital, an asset management firm, which made early stage investments in charter cities. He's been published in several newspapers and magazines, including the Chicago Tribune, City Journal, City AM, and Cato Unbound. Uh, I should also mention that Mark is a former board member of the Radical Exchange Foundation. So we're really glad to have him here today. Uh, next, we're joined by Professor Lon Kao. Um, she's a professor at Chapman University's Fowler School of Law. She's the Betty Hutton Williams Professor of International Economic Law. She joined the Fowler School of Law in 2013 after serving for more than a decade on the faculty of William and Mary Law School, where she was the Boyd Fellow and Professor of Law. She clerked for Judge Constance Baker Motley of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York and practiced with the law firm Paul Weiss in New York City. Professor Cao was a Ford Foundation scholar in 1991. She's published scholarly articles in the area of international trade and finance, international economic development, finance, and culture and law. She's also the author and co-author of several books and supplements, including the novel Monkey Bridge, uh, published in 1997, about the Vietnamese War and its impact on a young Vietnamese American girl. Finally, we're joined today by Tom Rossman, a consultant and author. Tom is uh, an international speaker and author that spent his career analyzing the economic, political, and social, social and cultural factors that determine growth and prosperity within society. As part of the newly formed Junto Group, his focus is exploring and developing a new model for society and the construction of an advanced urban ecosystem to help maximize human potential and a thriving urban environment for, new city, for a city in development. Um, Mr. Rossman began his professional career in finance, becoming a financial consultant and emerging markets specialist. He played a key role as country manager at the largest, largest Turkish investment bank, bringing American capital and investment to developing markets in the former Soviet Union, uh, Eastern Europe, Turkey, Middle East, and North Africa. He is the author of The Synthesis Revolution, a guide to more effective social and political decision making. And he has a master's degree from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. So with that introduction, um, First, I want to start at, at a really basic level, uh, because I think many, many audience members may not be familiar with the concept of charter city. So let's just first start and define our terms a little bit um, and just get clear on what we mean when we say charter city. So uh, perhaps if, if one, of, one, of, one of you on the panel wants to offer up an initial definition and others can add on and make distinctions uh, as, as seems productive, let's, let's start there. Sure. So I tend to, I think, define charter cities as uh, new cities with a special jurisdiction that allows for a different business environment than um, the rest of the host country. I, I would add one thing that I think is very uh, distinctive about charter cities is that um, sort of the common gestalt of, of uh, a lot of the charter cities is the desire in many ways to be able to start sort of like from scratch rather than cobbling together and working within an inefficient framework, right? A prior framework. How can we uh, start building a, a city with a different investment in, environment whereby you can almost kind of like bypass all the things that may be negative in that initial environment that keeps investment from coming in 
and jumpstart all the best qualities uh, that we have been able to accumulate by observation as to which jurisdictions have been most successful in attracting investment. So that's sort of the, the, in the overall desire is to bypass the national in some ways, the, the worst part of the national and create an international environment that's based on sound governance and practice. Yeah, I think one of the things that I, I, I find most intriguing about uh, charter cities is the notion that we're going to use a new set of tools to improve the existing operation, both legally, uh, the business environment, economic development, and the experimental method, which, you know, Thomas Jefferson called America the great experiment. And I think in many parts of our social sciences, we've kind of lost that, that willingness to use new tools to effectively uh, succeed in different parts of, of the mission that I think we all share, reducing poverty and increasing uh, equality and justice and, and fairness for everyone. Thank, thanks very much, everyone. I think that's a really, a really helpful basic place to start. And I, as moderator, I want to add just one, one addendum to this, which is um, specific to folks who might be joining us from a U.S. audience. Uh, the phrase "charter city" gets thrown around a lot within the U.S. and it has a very different meaning in many states and state constitutions. Um, states delineate certain cities as charter cities, which basically means they have their own charter, which is a type of legal document that. Um, you know, uh, uh, lays out that those cities um, powers and what they can and cannot do. And so um, that, that is not the type of charter city we're talking about today, as, as I, I hope you picked up from the, the definitions offered by our panelists. So this is um, for those in the US, this is a very different type of charter city than uh, what you might typically hear in, 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 a poli in urban policy discourse. Um, so moving on from that definition, uh, as, as a way of maybe elaborating a little bit on the introductions that I gave for each of you, uh, I think it would be helpful if you could each provide a little bit more context on the particular ways that you have each uh, worked on charter cities, um, you know, what locations, uh, whether it's in real world implementation or certain scholarly angles that you've pursued. Um, but I, I think let's get a little bit more context on how you've each approached the topic of charter cities. Well, I can start. Um, sure. In your introduction, uh, you, you mentioned Vietnam because I'm originally from Vietnam and I came to this country in 75 after the, the Vietnam War ended in the defeat of South Vietnam. And I've always been very interested because of my personal background in bridging my personal background with my scholarly interests, right, to sort of have a more unified uh, passion. And so I've, I've, since I became a lawyer um, and I, I, I started working with the, the, the various principles of what, why are some countries able to jumpstart the economy uh, and some are not able to. And there are so many different ways uh, in the scholarly realm, like you know, import substitution, export promotion, investment, uh, borrowing money from the World Bank, the IMF. Uh, and so I started looking at countries that have, six, because my, my field is international trade and international development. So uh, what is it that is the most efficient, the best way of uh, economic and political governance? So I, I started becoming very interested in the Honduras experiment, uh, which by the way, you know, is, is often viewed as sort of like, things that didn't work, but it turns out they, they have just successfully signed um, a, a ZD uh, investment with, uh, with, with a group called Prospera that I, I'd love to, to talk about uh, later on. But my, my question has always been, why are some countries rich, some countries poor? Uh, how do you get investment in? Why is Hong Kong a success? And some other countries like Vietnam not? And Vietnam, you know, has, has uh, had a lot of problems until the mid 80s or late 70s after economic catastrophe, uh, basically uh, getting economic growth from opening up the economy despite all claims to centralized control and a, a communist political system. And when they, so that interest of what environment is necessary has been my scholarly passion uh, since I started teaching in 
Uh, yeah, I think that's interesting. You mentioned Honduras. So my um, interest in charter cities goes back 10 or 11 years. Um, basically, right after undergrad, I heard a talk where somebody mentioned a guy named Michael Van Naughton who tried to build a free port in Somaliland. And I was like, this is an amazing idea because I was 20 and a very rational adult human being. Uh, fun fact, there actually is now a free port being built in Somaliland um, in Berbera by Dubai Ports World. They're investing about $400 million to build a port there. So perhaps that idea wasn't as uh, wacky as might have been uh, 10 years ago. And I, I went down sort of, I guess, the, the rabbit hole. There's been a small community of what might be described as uh, sort of techno libertarians interested in charter cities and innovative governance and competitive governance. And so people like Patrick Friedman, who founded the Seasteading Institute, I actually lived in Honduras for about six months, um, 2014 to 2015, uh, right? So for a little bit more context, there was red legislation, which was passed. Um, that's when Paul Romer was involved. That was struck down by the Supreme Court. Uh, and then um, Paul Romer left, and then similar legislation was passed called the Zeda legislation that was upheld by the Supreme Court. And uh, as uh, Lan mentioned, there was a project announced about a month or two ago um, called Prospera. And so uh, similarly, I'm motivated by the question of, yeah, why are some countries rich and some countries poor? And then also focusing a little bit more on the, the mechanism for change. Um, um, I think heavily influenced by like, institutional economics, uh, Douglas North, um, people like that, except there tends to be a little bit of a, uh, what might be described as a pessimism in um, institutional economics, where institutions take hundreds of years, sometimes thousands of years to form. Uh, and so because of that, uh, countries that don't have good institutions now are sort of uh, condemned to continued dysfunction and continued poverty, uh, because it can take generations to develop institutions that allow for basically participation in the modern economy. And I see charter cities as a policy tool that can help get around um, some of those arguments. And so I founded the Charter Cities Institute about two and a half years ago. Um, currently, we're working with a handful of projects, um, a new city development in Zambia called Nkwashi, which is being built for 100,000 residents. And so we signed a memorandum of understanding with the Zambia Development Agency to help them improve their special economic zone regime. Um, in February, but that's been sort of postponed by COVID a little bit. We're working with two projects in um, Nigeria. One is called the Nyimba Economic City. They're being built, it's a new city being built for 1.5 million residents, as well as Talent City, a new town being built for 30,000 residents. And then we're also working with a not yet public project um, in Central America, and we're in earlier conversations with a handful of others. Um, our approach is somewhat, um, I guess, a little bit pragmatic as compared to, I think, uh, an incremental compared to Paul Romer, where Romer, who originated the sort of modern term charter city, gave a TED talk. He went to Madagascar and then Honduras, and he was looking for like new city in the middle of nowhere, um, et cetera. And we're thinking about, okay, well, why not start with satellite cities? Why not start with people who are already building the cities and we can just focus on the governance angle instead of going for full um, autonomy. Let's see like, if it's possible to improve the business environment in um, one way or another. Uh, and that's been, I think, relatively successful uh, for us. And then additionally, I recently joined a, a, a group uh, called the Victoria Harbor Group. Um, it's a group of uh, Hong Kongers. I'm the only non-Hong Konger uh, who is looking to build, they're looking, we're looking to build a new city. Um, in a high income country to, uh, I guess, escape some of the changes in the current situation in, in Hong Kong that are um, um, making it not as livable as it used to be. And basically, we expect over the next 10 to 20 years, there'll probably be one to three million Hong Kong migrants. And while some of them will be able to easily move to New York, London and, and, and live similar lives, many of them don't have the financial resources or, or the relationships to do that. And so we're in uh, conversations about building a new city that can house them. Um, and to the extent possible, we're exploring the possibility of granting a degree of um, achieving a degree of legal autonomy that can make it a, a better business environment um, than if it just sort of had a typical uh, city jurisdiction. Well, well, my story is sort of a combination of, of Land and Mark's uh, uh, together. Um, I actually uh, was inspired by my experiences as a young uh, financial executive going throughout the former Soviet Union and seeing the way that, uh, you know, countries that are not too far away had developed uh, modern Western uh, societies and, and seeing the, the depression and the deprivation that existed in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. So um, um, right now I'm working with a group uh, that's we're backed by a, a, 
a tech entrepreneur. And, and our, our outlook is that, uh, you know, dynamic, creative, innovative growth is not in conflict with inclusive social policies um, that allow for equal opportunity and, and a high quality of life for people. And um, so our, our, our purpose, our uh, overlining uh, goal is really to focus on the ways where we can remove economic efficiencies from the current system and redirect that back into building the infrastructure uh, for greater equality, greater uh, inclusion, and, and fairness and a high quality of life for everyone. So we've looked at uh, many examples that have succeeded and many examples that haven't. And also, you know, what are the constituent elements of the happiest societies, the most successful societies? So our approach is, is kind of bringing that uh, macro uh, uh, infrastructure uh, together because I think a lot of cities have failed in the past because they haven't really uh, coalesced the the political and uh, social and cultural factors that have allowed uh, allowed it to get the necessary support. And so, um, you know, our feeling is that by by uh, approaching both the macro side of things and making sure those policies, and then using the great tools uh, like Radical Exchange talks about to effectively manage both the the, the political inclusiveness and also uh, economic prosperity. Um, that's widely shared. Thanks very much. So, um, picking up on 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 one thread that's come through a little bit, but we haven't sort of discussed directly. I'd like to kind of zoom in a little bit on the the set of problems that charter cities are designed to solve and the particular mechanisms that um, charter cities do that through. So in, in you know, I, th I think we settled on a general kind of definition of charter cities as cities within a broader host country that have, uh, you know, the flexibility, uh, the legal ability to sort of set different rules. Um, and, and we've you've 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 all mentioned a few times sort of like rules, um, you know, laws that are sort of better for economic growth in some way, whether that means it's like less burdensome to start and run a business. Um, but I'd like to I'd like to sort of pitch to you all how much of the benefit of charter cities is the rules themselves and how much of it is the enforceability or the the enforcement system of, of those rules. So to my my you know my limited knowledge, I'm certainly less of a charter cities expert than you all. Um, my understanding was that charter cities not only have different rules, but they frequently like outsource or have a different enforcement system. So you might have, you might be in one country, but be using the court system uh, of another of another country that's known to have like more reliable contract enforcement, for instance. And so then if I want to invest in a business, I'd be more likely to do it. And so could you maybe each talk through, uh, perhaps this varies based on the country and the context you're working on, but but how much of the, the magic of charter cities is changing the rules versus having more trust in the enforceability of those rules? Um, so, yeah, I think that's a good point. And one of the things that uh, we stress frequently at the Charter Cities Institute is both different rules, but also different administration. And so you could outsource the rules to a different country. That was uh, Paul Romer's vision, where, for example, Canada could act as a guarantor country in a country um, like Haiti and basically administer a city there. Uh, we're not sure that's sort of politically feasible or necessarily desirable. So we're pus pushing a public-private partnership model where a new city developer will build the city and then a special jurisdiction will be created that will have a different um, rule set as well as administrative body from the host country. Uh, but uh, at least in economic development, one of the terms that's sort of recently caught on is state capacity, which is basically how effective can a state execute tasks. And so you can think about um, a road. Can it build the road in a reasonable amount of time while uh, staying on budget? And a lot of uh, governments cannot do that. The US, for example, took about seven years to build an on-ramp to the Golden Gate Bridge in the late 2000s, while it, they built the Golden Gate Bridge in three years in the midst of the Great Depression. So I think the US, for example, has also had a decline in state capacity over the last uh, several generations. And so making sure that there is this, I think, separate administrative structure that is better able to enforce the rules, that is more responsive to the needs of the residents and the businesses, uh, that um, is, is a little bit more flexible and, and more effective is, is really crucial to the success of a uh, charter city. Um, <clears throat> I think one thing that one has to really balance is even if you have an economic set of rules that is the best, let's say the most efficient, uh, that is going to attract the most investment and is most investment friendly, there's, there's really, despite the desire to sort of escape the, the messiness of national politics, 
so you can start from scratch and have this great system. You, in reality, I don't think you're able to. So I think it's really important to realize that, especially in countries that need charter cities the most, which are the poor countries. These are countries that have extremely complicated uh, history with foreign powers. And there's no way you can escape that. You know, no matter if you, if, even if you create an administrative system that just sort of has a laboratory of new rules, it's still in the host country. And that host country is gonna have its own history. So there's always going to be the drag of history and the drag of politics. Um, so, and depending on the country, so I don't think you can have really a, uh, you know, what may work in one country where you're gonna have more, uh, where maybe Canada being the guarantor might work. Uh, having a foreign guarantor is not gonna work in another country. And it depends on maybe their colonial history and who the foreign guarantor is. So for example, I, I found it extremely uh, fascinating that you know, in, in, in uh, 2019, I think, in 2018, 2019, uh, Vietnam announced uh, a, 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 I guess it's a, I don't know if it's a law or regulation, but a, 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 the, the, the desire to form three new special economic zones. And special economic zones are similar enough to charter cities. You know, I, I think of charter cities as a more hyperkinetic um, special economic zone, but it tends to be an even more autonomous than, than special economic zones. But in Vietnam, they, they weren't even thinking of, of charter cities. They were just saying three special economic zones, three SEZs along the coast. And Vietnam has been just, you know, left, right, and center attracting foreign investment, but they wanted more, more radical uh, rules in these SEZs. And the Vietnamese are very sort of culturally interested in commerce, right? They wanna get in there and join the global community. And yet huge demonstrations all over the country. And it frightened the government because the demonstrations seemed to be so grassroots. And what sparked? these demonstrations, immense opposition. And the only worry is that the SEZ was going to create a situation where it's going to be mostly Chinese investment in Vietnam and the Vietnamese with a thousand year history of Chinese domination, the, the, the local population were not pacified by the government promises that, oh, this is not just gonna be Chinese, you know, it's gonna be other maybe American investors, which the, the, Pope, the population welcome. So, you know, there's just no way you can get rid of the history. And in, in the case of Vietnam, history of, you know, being very worried about China. And I think it's also important to realize that, you know, like I come from this with, with a desire to see a, a system where there is investment and there is also a, a decrease of poverty. And so we have to take into, consideration what you mentioned, the social justice dimension. And interestingly, every time that I have presented this, people are really concerned about foreign takeover, right? So the people that one claims would be most helped by this are the people that are like, oh my God, this is, this is like colonialism in disguise. So, there, so the, more, the more you take the local out, and put the foreign in, like foreign courts, foreign guarantors. Economically, it might be great, but it's gonna have backlash. So one really has to find out how one can calibrate these economic principles in a way that is going to be compatible with the local, even as we try to bypass the local. Yeah, I think that's right. Sorry, Tom, I'm gonna jump in again. Um... Uh, so, I, and that's sort of, I think, what we've tried to do with the Charter Cities Institute. So, for example, in Africa, the leads, uh, the city developers that we're working with in Zambia, it's a Zambian in Nigeria. There's two separate projects we're working with. Both are led by Nigerians. And we, I mean, it's not always possible because some projects are led by, new city developments are led by people not from the host country. But our preference whenever possible is to work with um, people from the host country. 
uh, the, the people who tend to be buying and or moving to the city tend to, to be from the host country. And as you mentioned, I think when you get the guarantor country, it does make it necessarily a bit more tricky. And so on the sort of charter city and special economic zone sliding scale, we might be a little bit more special economic zone than sort of if you call Paul Romer's the full loan um, charter city model, because getting this political buy-in, as you mentioned, is extremely crucial and making sure that there, there, there is definitely a geopolitical element to, to charter cities with countries being worried about uh, selling their autonomy and, and things like that. Um, uh, and so, I mean, we also, to a certain extent, I think, see it as a way to um, help countries build their own institutions. And so a lot of countries in emerging markets, their institutions are basically legacy colonial institutions where the colonial power left in the 60s or whenever. And the current institutions are just a sort of reflection of those. But charter cities, because you start with a blank slate, allow for um, something that might reflect the sort of needs and desires of the local population a little bit more. Obviously, you have to take into account that it also must reflect uh, the needs of the international market to allow for that uh, broad-based trade and exchange to allow the poverty alleviation to take place. But I think you can um, develop a framework that's flexible and allows uh, the balancing of those two. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, you know, one of the areas when we're looking at where uh, economic efficiency can be introduced and 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 have a unified approach in terms of economic development and a focus on people and uh, the purpose of making the quality of life better. One of the areas that we've identified uh, is land and uh, there is uh, trillions of dollars a year that a private gain that's being uh, um, um, captured by uh, private interests uh, through public investment. And so um, in order to address that and, and, and one of the areas that we find that's been really successful in, in, in merging this is, is Singapore, where they took an entirely different approach. So the, the idea is that the land is, is, is for everyone and, and basically owned by everyone, but at the same time, uh, there are certain needs in terms of economic development and also obviously housing. And they've, they've taken a very pragmatic approach with unique institutions kind of overcoming that colonial uh, heritage that they had. And uh, they have 80 to 90% home ownership, um, almost zero uh, uh, homelessness and uh, you know, very dynamic uh, uh, economic uh, uh, environment, which is, was rated recently as the uh, uh, second uh, easiest place to do business in the world. So, so our attempt is, is to, to bring all those elements together uh, by taking those inefficiencies and redirecting them into the investment for the, uh, the uh, quality of life for the citizens. Great, thanks. Um, and so moving on, we, one question, uh, one question that came in from the audience and also something I was planning to ask you, so it's a good time to, to go to those questions, uh, is from uh, from Peter, who is asking, where is the best place to build a charter city today? And sort of the, the version of that I, I, I wanted to ask was, was just, you know, generally, what are the different criteria you would look for in a host country that would make that country a particularly good or not as good host um, uh, to, to, to think about starting a charter city? Sure. So at least when, when we're looking at potential uh, locations, what we think about, one, our model is to partner with people who are building new cities on the ground. So that tends to be a determining factor. But then in addition, we also look at things like urbanization rate. Um, some places, for example, Europe are not urbanizing at all. And in fact, like to a certain extent, some of the urban populations are declining just because of demographic changes. Uh, so there isn't a lot of demand for new cities, much less charter cities. Also, if you look at high income countries tend to be well governed enough, right? There's definitely a lot of improvements that can be made in high income countries. But even if you make all those improvements, you might be talking about the 30, 40% bump in GDP per capita. If you build in low income countries, you could talk to, be talking about a 20X um, increase in uh, GDP per capita, just so the gains in um, some emerging markets are much larger. Uh, so I think population is important. Um, the, the sort of how well the country is governed is important in looking at changing trade routes. Most cities tend to be built, um, a lot of cities tend to be built on trade routes, whether it's a port, whether it's a sort of natural like pass through mountains, et cetera. Um, so identifying where those trade routes are emerging and uh, building there. 
Um, obviously, you need, I think, the support from the host country. So getting the political buy-in, if there's a country that is resistant to it, uh, then you're not going to make any progress, no matter how good the, the project is. And then third, once you get a little bit more specific, I tend to think you want to locate about two hours outside an existing city with an airport, um, namely because infrastructure is expensive. So if you build a new city in the middle of nowhere, you've got few billion dollars of infrastructure costs, but you can probably in most, uh, in a lot of countries acquire 100 to 200 square kilometers within two hours of a major city. The land is cheap enough that you can buy all of it, or at least like lease all of it. Um, plus, but you are able to have access to existing infrastructure and airport um, that allows you to reduce uh, some of the initial capital expenditures that um, otherwise might make a charter city uh, prohibitive. I, I, oh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was going to, I'm, I'm not involved on the ground in this, so I would defer more to the two of you, but I do have a, a small point, and it, it would link up to what Tom was saying about the land, and also it goes to your paper, Paul, which is a, is a fascinating paper. Uh, it, it would seem to me like if you're going to um, get the land to, to start the project. I mean, you're gonna need a location. So the land issue is going to be uh, a common denominator, no matter where you decide to uh, build the charter city. So the issue of title and valuation are going to be just endemic and, and sort of embedded in, in, in where you decide you're going to choose uh, as, as a location. So, you know, that's why your paper, Paul, on, on salsa to me is so fascinating, right? Because valuation is such an issue, especially in countries that don't have a vibrant market. Um, and how are you going to get comparables and things like that if the, if the market has been either manipulated or so inefficient that you can't even get a market valuation. So the salsa, uh, and I'll let you talk about it later, is I think is, is just a great way to address that dilemma. But the other dilemma, I think, with respect to where you're going to choose a location has to be the issue of title. Um, and that is a big problem in many third world countries because title may be very muddled. I mean, De Soto wrote a whole book on this. Um, so once you have the title, then I think the investor group can use Salsa to do the valuation. But you know, where do you, who, who, who is in charge of leasing? What if it's kind of like, you know, there's no re recording of land title. Uh, so I guess we may want to bypass those places. That would be one issue that I, I bet if Mark goes to a place and the title is all over the place, um, that place is, is, is going to be a problem in terms of establishing any kind of, of, of um, charter city there. Yeah, um, directly to the issue, I think our research has clearly shown that edge cities, uh, as as uh, Mark was was alluding to, um, the edge cities are definitely the preference because um, the infrastructure that you can piggyback on, also something that people don't think about, but supply chains, um, and and also housing. You want to draw you know workers from from the surrounding region as well as from the city itself. So I, I completely agree. And you know one other uh, point you know that, that Land was making I think is very. Uh, uh, insightful, you know, DeSoto used Egypt. I can tell you from my experiences in Egypt that 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 uh, it is absolutely a crisis when individuals can't build wealth. You know, today in America, we're having this conversation about inequality. Uh, the Af African American families make sixty percent of of what whites. Uh, families do in income, but an even more uh, a jarring statistic is the fact that uh, their net worth is only 10% of, of the average uh, white family. So, so, and part of that has to do with land and ownership and owning the home and being able to, to uh, uh, transition that wealth through the generations and build that wealth through the generation. So I think definitely dealing and you know, not to harp on Singapore, but one of the things that they did really well is make sure that they could have uh, individuals who had uh, that economic engine of, of, of buying and owning uh, uh, their home, but at the same time uh, provide affordable housing so that uh, they could have a, a, a relatively inexpensive workforce for companies that were coming and locating in, in the country. So a very successful model in that sense. Great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so I do, as, as Lan mentioned, I do want to turn very soon to 
speaking about radical exchange mechanisms in charter cities. Uh, one final question, and we can keep this one a little bit briefer, uh, just on charter cities generally, is um, you're, you know, because you're all on this panel right now, you're presumably fairly optimistic about uh, the potential now for charter cities. But as as Mark mentioned earlier, you know, the idea has been around for a while, and there have been some some uh, experiments that haven't succeeded. And so, what what would you all say is different right now? Uh, you know, the I guess Mark and Tom, because you're involved on the ground, uh, what is what are you doing differently that will make uh, the current initiatives uh, go better than uh, the, the the former charter cities that haven't succeeded? Sure, um, I think two things. One, just what we learned from Paul Romer is that uh, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, so you want to diversify and potentially take a slightly more incremental approach. Uh, that way, you can build up small wins, you can build up knowledge, you can build up how to do this. I mean, nobody really knows what it means to create a legal system from scratch. So one of the things the Charter Cities Institute is doing is developing a governance handbook that can help share some of the practices of what does it actually mean to create a legal system from scratch in terms of like land acquisition, right? Um, that's a challenge that land brought up. Um, how do you actually acquire 100 square kilometers, especially when title is unclear? Some of the partners that we are working with are doing this in a relatively comprehensive manner. And so once they are successful, that information can be shared and that can become a model uh, for uh, sort of broader diffusion. So I see it to a certain extent as a learning process, um, uh, right? It takes time to learn a new skill and building cities from scratch with new legal systems is a new skill that requires a lot of moving parts. Uh, and so it takes time for, right, like to train this, the, the people who are able to do that. Another thing, for example, that we are thinking about is just training a class of city administrators. Um, so, right, if you build a new city for a million people, who administers it? You might not want people from the host country um, in the host country government because they've sort of been inculcated into a culture that isn't as effective as the culture you want. You might be able to hire some expats to come back um, who might currently be abroad and educated in high income countries, but you probably can only fill like 10 to 20 percent of the positions like that. So you need a, basically a training mechanism to train the rest of the administrative class of um, a charter city. And I think the second reason why I'm, I guess, more optimistic about what's happening now is just, I mean, it's hard to sort of communicate this, um, but there's a lot more going on on the ground than there was 10 years ago. I mean, I've been in this space for a while and there's a lot more happening and the projects are a lot more real. Uh, so, um, I, I, yeah, like people reach out to me much more frequently than, than they did several years ago. There, there's right, it's not as really public because Paul Romer is Paul Romer and he did a TED talk and like he's a he was a Nobel laureate then, but he is now. Um, but just in terms of the actual like interest on the ground and the appetite for these projects, it's much higher than it was. Yeah, I also I also think there's a, a sea change just in terms of the way that people look at this. You know, uh, last year, 181 CEOs signed a uh, signed a memo with the Business Roundtable saying that that uh, the shareholder profit maximization model and and the sort of supply side model that we've been working with for the last 40 years uh, really needs some 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 major changes. And I think there's a there's a along with what's happening now with with the the, uh, the, the racial protests and things um, there's a lot of uh, recognition that we need to have a new approach and I think one of the one of the things that I very experienced in and with emerging markets is is that you really have to get to a point where people understand it in an intuitive way and uh, um, a lot of people came into the Russia and the former Soviet Union saying you know this is a better way to do things but that didn't quite work out because they didn't understand it. They didn't have a framework to, to, to work it into their daily understanding. And that each and every city that we've analyzed that have failed, including you know uh, Google's recent uh, withdrawal from the Toronto project, is uh, at the heart of it was because the people just weren't supportive. So I think you know we're we're on the ground doing the mic micro management and and the waste management systems and all that. That's that's vital and important in the legal system, obviously as well. But uh, bringing, uh, having a framework for people to understand it and really make it a part of their thinking and, and believe that it can positively change their lives. I think that's something that a lot of the failed projects that we've witnessed really didn't do well. Great, thanks. So I want to I wanna quickly now transition. Uh, I'm, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to transition a little bit from moderator to presenter mode here to uh, introduce three of the uh, radical exchange ideas that uh, we are most excited about um, with respect to charter cities. So as, as Lan alluded to, um, Matt Pruitt and I have uh, written a, a policy paper, which will be coming out uh, 
in the coming weeks through with a class as a collaboration with the charter with Mark's Charter Cities Institute. Um, and so in the paper, uh, th these slides are like, this will be like the two minute version of the paper. So um, in the paper, we discuss how three radical exchange concepts uh, we think are potentially really good fits for um, sort of pilot experiments in charter cities because charter cities are already, as you as you know, know um, interested in you know new and more innovative ways of, of running cities to improve uh, growth and prosperity. And, and that's generally what we at Radical Exchange want to do. Um, and, and, and so in so we want to sort of revamp urban policy and doing that in charter cities seems like a great a great setting. Um, and given the challenges of charter cities in particular, I, I think that the, the, the fit is even heightened. So um, I'm going to do a very quick sort of one minute, uh, one minute sort of pitch or description of these mechanisms, and then we can open it up for a bit more of a free flowing discussion where, you know, the, the the three of you can comment on whichever mechanisms you think you you know you you have lost say on whether you think they're good ideas or bad ideas for charter cities. Uh, this is all obviously work in progress, and we're here to to bat around ideas, um, and then we'll we'll save a little time at the end for audience questions. Although luckily some of the questions were about radical exchange ideas, and so we'll be covering those here. Um, so first, uh, SALSA, uh, also also known as COST uh, in radical exchange uh, terminolo terminology. So this is uh, self-assessed licenses sold via auction. The diagram here it just shows at a really basic level how this works. Um, there's some asset. So in a, in a charter city, that might be a plot of land or a license to do a particular thing um, that is purchased at auction. Uh, the owners then maintain a valuation, a self-assessed valuation um, that, that they just personally input into an online marketplace. Uh, they pay a tax rate, a salsa rate on that, uh, their self-assessed valuation. So it's basically like a property tax on the value that you assign to the asset. Um, and they stand ready to sell, to, to be compelled to sell that asset at their self-assessed valuation. So it's a system that incentivizes people to uh, assess their assets honestly because they can be bought at that price at any time. And so it's, it's sort of the radical exchange a hybrid of commonly held property and, and private property. Um, and we, we think it has lots of great qualities. And so um, that's the mechanism. In charter cities in particular, we think it would be a great fit for commercial property. So the, the land that is actually used to sort of start the city and that will be used for um, you know, productive commercial purposes. Um, and then public licenses or leases. So if you wanna control congestion, you could use Salsa for allocating a, a quota of a certain number of vehicles that could be in use at a given time um, and adjust that upward or downward as you observe congestion trends. And so, so basically a public license to do uh, almost anything where you, you're gonna have a scarce space or scarce capacity. So that's, that's Salsa. Quadratic voting, um, folks in the audience may be a little bit more familiar um, because this this is one of our more prominent mechanisms that has been used in the real world to uh, to some extent at this point already. Um, this diagram in the bottom left here is basically, uh, you know, a snapshot of what what is quadratic voting. It's a voting method where you are putting credits to express the intensity of your preferences um, on the, the the range of things you're voting on, and there's a quadratic cost. So one vote, one credit two votes, that'll be four credits, three votes, nine credits. So you get to, it's a voting system that allows you to express your preferences to express a loud voice, but it's increasingly costly to have that loud voice. Um, and the, the picture on the bottom right here is the distribution of preferences that you you get. So this is from our work in uh, the state of Colorado, the Democratic caucus in the state legislature. Um, when you put a cost, a quadratic cost on voting, you see that some that the, these were spending bills that the, the caucus was prioritizing. Some of the bills are really preferred and you get this big long tail of things that people kind of care about and you wouldn't see that uh, nuance with just a yes, no vote or just a ranked vote. Um, so that's quadratic voting. We think in charter cities, this could be helpful uh, at the governance level. So uh, whatever sort of governing committee, whether that's a type of a city council or sort of um, management committee of the charter city, they, they could use this in just the same way that the Colorado government did to prioritize uh, things they want to use charter city funds to, to do. So, you know, choosing among particular infrastructure projects um, or whatever, whatever the case may be. And, and then external citizen facing uh, elections. So we think basically quadratic voting is an improvement upon certainly regular voting and even ranked choice voting. So if there is a mayoral election in a charter city, um, we think this would just be a better sort of democratic system to use for uh, having that election. So internal and external applications of quadratic voting. Uh, finally, quadratic finance. Um, this is a slightly newer mechanism since it wasn't in the book Radical Markets, but has uh, taken off within the radical exchange community. So it's a, it's a method of funding public goods 
we, we, we certainly don't have enough time now to go, to go through formulas, but basically the research on this is, 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 is pretty great and shows that quadratic finance solves uh, a lot of the, collect the collective action and coordination problems in public good provision generally. Um, and so if you need to solicit preferences and voluntary contributions from a group of people in funding some common project, um, this is going to be a better mechanism than uh, you know, asking people to pay voluntarily or uh, just you know, asking them to, to, to give what they want um, or put their own value on how much they, they like something. Um, and so, you gen so quadratic finance generates um, a public match that augments voluntary contributions and rewards more widely shared preferences uh, because of the quadratic formula. So you get a total funding amount uh, which is in bold here by adding the square roots of the contributions um, then squaring to get the total amount you subtract uh, the total from the amount that was actually pledged by individual people that gets you a match uh, so you get a larger match when more people pledge smaller amounts um, we think in charter cities uh, you know insofar as you have public projects to fund um, this would be this would be a great way to fund them so in infrastructure projects um, public campaign finance as well. If you're gonna, if you're allowing private citizens to contribute to political campaigns, um, this this could you know potentially be a more a much more fair way than uh, at least the way that campaign finance is currently regulated in in the U.S., where large uh, large private groups and special interests can sort of drown out uh, maybe more widely shared preferences among the majority. Um, so those are those are the three mechanisms: uh, salsa, quadratic voting, quadratic finance. So I'd love to turn it over to the group now and see if you you all have thoughts on any one of those, and we can take the discussion in in many directions. I, I have a question, Paul. Um, I'm I'm familiar with salsa as it's been applied in land acquisition. You mentioned in your paper uh, in Chile and Singapore. Um, but those are the two countries that I've been, yeah. uh, you know, I, I've seen it working really well. Chile and Singapore are quite economically advanced, though, mm -hmm. um, you know, with a pretty vibrant uh, pre-existing market before, uh, before the, the wave of foreign investment, even the, the modern wave. Mm -hmm. But could you think something like salsa would work in Egypt? Or in Vietnam, you know, where, where for Egypt is not necessarily communal. That's not what I'm talking about. Not not like a collective land title, but uh, inconsistent record keeping. Let's say, you know, even if there's a, a even if there is a pre-existing private property of land allowed, the, the the record is just muddled. And then there are some where you know, it it may not be an issue. Uh, in areas like Mark had mentioned, you know, that, that if it's closer to the airport and things like that, maybe there's a really clear title. But if you go the Paul Romer route where it's like some distant place, mm -hmm. um, then the title may be more communal fishermen, you know, maybe vying over who owns it. So the, the pre-existing requirement for salsa would have to be a relatively stable country that already yeah. has some kind of pretty good record keeping, right? Yeah, I think to some extent, to, I think to a large extent that's true. And that's why with this paper and this work, I think we're particularly excited about charter cities because char charter cities are already you know, creating this jurisdiction that's gonna have heightened um, contract enforcement and uh, maybe a different regime for yeah, enf enforcing agreements. And so you do have to have a basic level of assigning it like like you said record keeping and the ability to enforce a transfer right if i if if i have my asset in the system and someone buys it and then i just am like i'm not giving you i'm not giving it to you too bad you know then the system breaks down and so i think that's why like within broader settings where that capacity isn't there i think charter cities would provide like a good space to experiment and show oh this this does work in this country and it is producing some good outcome and so we should think about expanding it um but I don't think it would work in this in this new place, Pros Prospera, that Mark also mentioned, uh, which is in Roetan, uh, in Honduras. Yeah, where the, their their common law is basically, you know, a lot of open source legal system, um, the restatement. Um, yeah. So it's kind of more like an international commercial system, yeah. Yeah. not necessarily rooted in any kind of national law, and that would also bypass. The problem of this is a, a, a neo-colonial mandate. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I largely agree with that. Um, 
other do others others on the panel have 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 thoughts on this topic of of salsa in charter cities and 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 host countries more broadly? Yeah, I mean, I think I mean to me, salsa is one of the I, I guess the most interesting aspect of of radical exchange. Uh, uh, right, there have been a lot of proposals on sort of how to quote unquote reinvent society, but salsa is actually a relatively concrete proposal that sort of um, challenges one of the most fundamental, I don't know, social constructs, uh, at least of um, Western societies, which is uh, freehold land ownership or freehold property yeah. ownership. And um, it's not, to me, it's not exactly clear how it would work. Right. It's one thing to put together a sort of mechanism design proposal on paper. It's another thing to actually um, implement it. Uh, but that being said, it's definitely worth trying. I don't even think you have to do it in a developing country per se. Uh, salsa, you don't need national government to pass regulations. If you are a developer and you buy all the land and you create a like condominium association or some sort of homeowners association, you can pass whatever rules you want in that homeowners association. Um, so you don't need national government uh, consent to experiment with uh, these types of reforms. That being said, the sort of uh, Hayekian in me um, cautions against trying to go all out at once. So for example, starting with experimentation, for example, with like uh, public parking spaces or with a small subset of commercial lots or with natural resources, yeah. for example, the wireless spectrum. And then after those experiments uh, are proven out, then sort of expanding it to involve a, a larger um, sort of subset uh, of the property that you apply uh, also to. Yeah, we're, we're just as you said, Mark, we, we are really excited about those initial applications like parking and other public assets that it would be easy to show like, okay, either this is working or it isn't and kind of incrementally build from there. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very sorry to announce that we've hit our time limit. Um, and we, we got to, we addressed a couple of the audience questions through the discussion here, but largely, uh, largely through my fault as a moderator, because uh, so much of this discussion was so interesting and thought provoking. Um, we don't have time to get to many of those questions. Um, and so I'm going to have to, we're going to have to call it, uh, call it now. And I wish I could, I wish I could ask the audience to join me in thanking you and give you, give you all a great standing ovation. Um, cause this was, this was really, uh, a really fantastic panel. So thank you all so much for joining us. And to everyone who's been watching and listening, thank you for tuning in and we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks for having us.